Hey everyone, thanks for joining a couple minutes early. Um, we're going to get started right at six, so I'm going to give a couple more minutes for others who might be joining closer to then.
Hi everyone, so according to my clock, it is six o'clock, so I think we should go ahead and just get started here. Um, thanks everyone for joining today. We have a little bit of a smaller group. Um, and today we're gonna be talking about Blackboard test surveys and pools as part of the SUNY CPD Remote Teaching Clinic. Uh, my name is Nina Santiago. I work with the Open SUNY Help Desk, so I'm gonna help to run this session today. Um, what I'd like to ask here is if we can hold questions until the end of the session, we'll have a designated time at the end to go through those questions. In the meantime, though, just a quick housekeeping thing. If everyone could take a moment to locate the chat button at the bottom of the Zoom window, and you may need to enlarge the window to full screen to see all those options. I'd like everyone to post a quick comment or a hello, just so we all know where that chat is. Perfect, and I see a couple of those going in there. So I will go ahead and get us started. So as I mentioned, we're gonna be talking about Blackboard tests. So what we're gonna start by doing is seeing what a test looks like to a student in Blackboard. So I'm actually already logged in through a test student account and actually I gotta get rid of a couple windows so I can get my way around here. So I'm logged into Blackboard as a student. I have a test student account here ready to go. So as a student, the first thing I wanna do in order to find a test is to take a quick look for the icon. You'll notice that the icon here will be a piece of paper with the corner folded, a pencil with the green check mark and the red X. That is gonna indicate that this is a Blackboard test. The other thing is that a student may wanna double check the title of it and the instructor can always make sure that the title is reflective of the type of task this is. So in this case, it's a test. So as a student, I'm gonna click on the title of this test. And this takes me to a landing page with some basic information about the due date, the test timer, multiple attempts and all of that. And I'm gonna go ahead and press begin. At this point now, the test timer is running. And so I'm gonna just show you quickly what some question types are gonna look like. So first we have an essay question. So as a student, I'm gonna type my answer. And once I'm done, we're gonna see that this little marker here will indicate that my answer has been saved. And if I'm not sure if it's saved, I can always resave it just by clicking on that box. So now we have a matching question that's based on some images. So I'm just gonna go ahead and choose. I'm not gonna answer every single question on this test, just in the interest of time. So I'm gonna skip right over these. This is a uh, quiz bowl question, which is a Jeopardy style question. Um, and I wish I could say I was clever, but this is something that comes from an SNL sketch a million years ago. So I'm gonna say that the answer here, hamburger. And then next we have what's called a hotspot question where the student has to click on the correct location on the map to answer the question. The image that I uploaded here as the instructor is this map. So I'm gonna go ahead and click Uruguay. Then when we keep scrolling down, we have a multiple choice question. What is the capital of Colombia? I'm gonna answer it wrong. Then we have a jumbled sentence question. We have a math equation. And then we have another essay question. I'm just gonna type in some random letters. So now that I'm done, I'm gonna skip over this truth. Actually, I'll answer that. I'm gonna hit save and submit. And it tells me that the following questions may be incomplete. I'm gonna hit okay. And now it brings me to this page to confirm that my test has been submitted. And I hit okay now. And depending on how much information my instructor has decided students will be allowed to see, that will determine how much will show on this page. So in, in this case, not a ton of information. So at this point, now that we've seen what a student sees during a test, just as a quick overview, let's go into a course and actually go through the process of creating a test. So I have gone into my normal instructor account through this course. And you'll notice that the controls will look pretty familiar here with build content in your control panel. When we're building a test, the best place to start is actually through your control panel. What you'll wanna do is to start by going to course tools 
And when you click on that to expand it, it's going to expand a series of options that are ordered alphabetically. And we're going to scroll down and then click tests, surveys, and pools. And then from here, we're going to go up and click tests. And this will take us to a page that shows us any tests that exist in the course, regardless of whether or not they've been linked into a content area. So the test that I just took before and was demoing was exam number one, which is located under content. And you can see deployed, that tells us where it's located. There are two other exams here that are not deployed, which means no students have access. And then another one, exam four, from an earlier demo session that I did. So would we want to start a new test? We start by going up here to build test. That part's pretty self-explanatory. We're going to give it a name. I'm going to call this exam five. Now the description and instructions are optional, but two fields that you can make use of if you wanted to provide students with some information about what this exam will um, be used for and instructions, etc. Not required, so I'm going to go ahead and press submit. And this takes us to the test canvas. Now this is going to be your construction space where you can add, edit, or reorder questions in the test. When we want to start building questions, we're going to come up here to the space that says create question. And actually I should move down a little bit so you can see this whole menu. You'll notice that there's a lot of different question types some of which are questions that will grade automatically and some of which involve auto grading. There's a lot of different question types, but some of the more commonly used ones are things like multiple choice, true false, or essay questions, or even file response where student uploads a file in order to respond to the question if it's like an Excel file. So what I'd like to start by showing you is a multiple choice question. So I'm going to click multiple choice. And now this takes me to the page where we're going to go top to bottom and fill out this page to create a multiple choice question for students to answer. So first here, question title. That's not required. That's really just a label for yourself. You don't necessarily need to use it. Where you would actually place the question is in this box labeled question text. So in this case, the question I'm going to say students will have to answer is what color is the sky. After we've typed in the question, we're going to scroll down here to options. And this is going to determine a little bit of how this, the uh, question is presented to students and how credit could be allocated. So answer numbering, this would determine if the options students have to choose from will be numbered in Arabic or Roman numerals or upper or lowercase letters. And I'm going to choose lowercase letters, really a matter of preference. Next, we have answer orientation. Between vertical and horizontal, pretty self-explanatory, this would be that options A, B, C, and D are in a vertical line as opposed to a horizontal line. Having it vertical might make a little bit better use of the real estate of the screen, so I'm going to leave that. Next, we have the option of allowing partial credit. We don't necessarily need to do that, but that would be to say that maybe option A is the correct answer. Option B will give students 25% of the credit. When you check that, that would allow you to then, I'll show you in a moment, make some changes to how much credit could be allocated. But you'll also notice that this option shows up, allow negative scores for incorrect answers. You could also check this if you wanted to actually deduct points for students answering the question incorrectly. Now that would be, in, in addition to not earning points beyond just not getting any credit, that would deduct the, the points from the student's final grade on the test. That's not something that's used particularly often, but in some of the training webinars I've seen from Blackboard as a company, they say that sometimes this can be used for things like nursing courses, where the answer to the question may be so incorrect that it actively harms the student, I'm sorry, the patient's health. So that's something that you do have the ability to use, but not required, but kind of a cool feature that you can make use of if you'd like. And then here, show answers in random order so that options A, B, C, and D are shuffled each time a student takes this test. 
So next I'm going to go down to the answers field. So I have it set to four possible answers. We have answer number one and then this bubble to designate this to be the correct answer. And I'm going to say the correct answer. Oops, I have to scroll up. The correct answer is blue. Incorrect answer responses, I'm going to say polka dot. Third answer, stripes. And then last, who knows? And again, because we checked that box for partial credit, you'll notice that we have this field now show up. So if we wanted to say partial credit is an acceptable answer, but will only give students 25% credit, you can type that field in. And then the others would give them no credit. We don't necessarily need to use partial credit. So if we uncheck this, you'll see that it's just correct or incorrect. So credit or no credit. Next on this page, we have feedback. So depending on the settings that you have for the visibility of the test once it's completed, you can choose response feedback to show to students. And this would be dependent on whether they got the question correct or incorrect. It's not required, but you could type something in here to say, congratulations, this is the correct answer. We could also type in incorrect response feedback to say, this is not correct. Please review chapter three. Optional fields, but can be pretty useful if you do like to have some of that feedback built into the test after students have taken it. Next on the page, we have categories and keywords. Again, totally optional. They're just ways to manage your test questions in your course. If you wanted to add labels to do with categories, topics, excuse me, levels of difficulty and keywords, not required, but can be pretty useful. And then lastly, we have instructor notes. If you wanted to give yourself a note about what this question is or whatever the case might be. So now that I'm done creating this question, I'm gonna press create, I'm sorry, submit and create another. And I'll see this green success bar at the top that says question created, confirming that the question is in fact done and takes me right into creating another multiple choice question. So I'm going to hit cancel on this since I'm not actually going to create another one of these right now. I want to show you now what an essay question looks like since that's another commonly used one. So I'm going to go right up to create question and then go down to essay. Some of these options are going to look familiar based on what we just saw. So again, we're going to have the question title. We don't necessarily need to use that. And then we have our question text box, which is what the students, the question that the students will have to answer. So I'm just going to say question text goes here just as some placeholder text. Next, again, depending on the settings that you use for how visible answers and feedback is going to be after students are done, you can set up a model answer here as an example of a correct response. It's not required though, and again, this is not going to be a test question that auto grades, but this can be a useful place. So, example of a, cor oops, a correct response goes here. And then we're going to come down to the spot that has rubrics, which unfortunately we don't have time to cover in today's session. Rubrics are one useful way of grading and having consistency in how students are evaluating, but it does involve a fair amount of setup. So for any questions that might come up about rubrics, I'd encourage you to reach out to the Open SUNY Help Desk and we can point you in the direction of a couple of resources. There are also some good help documentation pages on help.blackboard.com. So if you are interested in that, you can certainly check that out. But for today, I'm going to skip right over that. And then likewise, again, I'm going to skip right over these since we just talked about that. And now that I'm done, I'm going to go ahead and press submit. So now we have two questions that have been built into this test canvas. 
And let's say I want to adjust this point. You're going to see that regardless of the question type, the default point value will be 10. And I just want to click on that and say, nope, it's only going to be two points. I can also designate this as an extra credit question just by checking this box and then pressing submit. So now this will say extra credit. This essay question means that the total point value of this test is 10 and students can earn up to two extra credit points on top of their grade. And of course it wouldn't deduct any points if they got it incorrect. But I'm just going to revert that back so that it's worth two points and it's a 12 point question. I'm sorry, 12 point test. So there's a couple of other question types that do involve a little bit more setup and a little extra attention into how you approach the setup. Now these are a couple of options I want to show you for test question types that are auto graded. We have fill in the blank, which consists of a phrase, a sentence, or a paragraph with a blank space where a student provides the missing word or set of words. Since these are graded automatically, but they have a free text field for the answer, you would have to consider the best evaluation using either exact match, contains part of an answer, or matches pattern. And Blackboard's help site has a list of formattings you can use to anticipate potential misspellings, abbreviations, or other things of that nature. We also have hotspot, which is that question type I was showing you before with the map. This is actually a pretty nice and easy one to demo for you, so I'm going to do that. The hotspot is going to be where the student is presented an image and they have to click on a particular area to indicate their answer to the question, which is also something that will be graded automatically. So I'm going to set one of, this up, one of these up pretty quickly. And I'm going to say, please click on the door. I have a photo ready to go of the Sistine Chapel where the student is going to have to identify a door. So now that I've uploaded it, let's pretend this door isn't here. There's only one door. I draw a little rectangle around this door. The student would have to click within the confines of this rectangle in order to answer the question correctly. If they answer by clicking anywhere outside of that rectangle, they would not get points. So this question type can be used for things like this or maybe even anatomy and physiology to identify different structures. Um, uh, let me think, a couple of other different uh, uses would be geography or things like that. So definitely something pretty cool that you can make use of. And then there is also another question type that's called quiz bowl. So when I go up here, you'll see it's listed as quiz bowl. And this is a Jeopardy style question where students are presented with an answer and they have to provide the question. So much like fill in the blank, you would have to provide possible answer phrases. You have to be mindful of variations in spellings, plurals, common abbreviations, and you would set the interrogatives of who, what, when, etc. So it would be who is, I'm sorry, uh, this is the host of Jeopardy. And then the question that the student would have to respond with to get the answer correct would be who is Alex Trebek. So from here, let's go and talk a little bit about pools. So pools are going to be what you can consider to be a construction space in your course where you have almost like buckets of questions. So when I go back over to test surveys and pools, this is a page we got to at the beginning of our session. When we come to pools, you can have a reserve of questions that are ready to go stored for repeated use. You can import pools if you have a set of questions that are coming from a publisher. What you want to be mindful of, though, is that on our help desk, we have seen situations where students are able to do a Google search for questions using, you know, quotation marks and then being able to locate um, answer guides. So I guess one, you know, small consideration from a technical side, though, you can import pools with the files that publishers would give you it would come as a zip file and then you just use browse my computer and then submit. To see what a pool really looks like though, I'm going to edit this one that I've created. And this is going to look pretty familiar to what we were just looking at. So these are a series of questions that I have set up and we can go through the construction process here. Again, choosing from all of these question types. What I want to show you now is how we can actually take questions from this pool 
and place it into one of our tests. So I'm going to use the breadcrumb trail at the top of the page and come back to tests and come back to exam number five. So we have the option of reusing questions from several different places within your course. So I'm going to start by hovering over reuse questions and I'm going to go down to find questions. So I can either say that I want to pull a question from one specific test that has already been created. I can also choose a question from that pool that I was just showing you. And I can choose however many I'd like, and this in effect functions like a shopping cart. Once I'm done, I press submit, and that will add to the total number of questions that we have in this test. Now total questions, 57, total points, 59. We have two other options for reusing questions. We'll see the option for creating a question set. What I wanna show you is what this looks like. When we come to a question set, we can come to a pool and say we're gonna grab, let's say seven questions. When we hit submit, we'll see total questions goes up to eight. And the reason for that is when we look down here, down past all of those other individual questions, we created a set of questions, which is effectively a group, where we can say out of the seven questions that I selected, students would be expected to answer three at random. And that would mean that this is shuffled for each student whenever they take this test. The other option that you have, which is pretty similar to that, is to come up here and use random block. And that's gonna be pretty similar where we would take all of the question, all of the questions from an existing pool as is. So that pool has to be totally done and ready to go. We'll press submit. And then again, the random block. Out of those 10 questions, students would be answering maybe five of those questions, again, at random. So now that we've gotten a sense of how the construction process goes. We're not going to be able to go through every single question type just because of our limited time here. But again, we have a whole series of different question types that we can choose from. So let's imagine that this exam five is ready to go and we want to place it into a content area for students to see and take. Our next step would be to deploy the test. So we would start by going to content. And then from content, we're going to go up to assessments. When we hover over assessments, then we click test. And then we're going to go down to add an existing test. And then we'll see the name exam five, what we were just working on, and we'll press submit. Now this is going to take us to our test options page where we get to determine how long students can see this test, how many attempts they have, and question shuffling and all of those other kind of housekeeping elements of testing in, in courses. So what we're going to do, again, starting top to bottom, going through all of the options on this page, we can have a content link description. And this would be a description of the test prior to the student even clicking on it. So not necessary. And I'm going to go ahead and press uh, type in text goes here, just as some placeholders. And then you can have the test open up in a new window if you'd like, not required, but an option that you can make use of if you'd like. Next, we're going to go down to test availability. The first one I want to bring your attention to is make available to students. If we want students to see this test, it has to be selected as yes. If we want to see, if we want students to see this test with only, within only a particular window of time, we have to select yes. And then to actually skip down to a series of options beneath this to display after and display until. So if we have these used, then we can say the test will be available to students starting on Monday the 30th at 8 a.m. And then we'll only show to them until say the 31st at 11.59 p.m. In order for these display after and display until dates to function, 
make available to students does have to be set as yes. If it's set to no, they will not take effect and students will not see the test. So we want this to be marked as yes. So next we have the option of adding a new announcement when this test is made available. And that's just an automated message coming from Blackboard saying exam five is now available. Not required, but another useful option if you're interested. Then we have the option for multiple attempts. If we would like students to be able to take this test more than once, by default, it's only gonna say one attempt. And if we have this checked, then that would allow us to say, maybe students will be allowed to take this test three times. We can also allow them to take the test an unlimited number of times, which is exactly as it sounds. And when we have more than one attempt being used, you'll notice here that there is the option that says score attempts using, and we get to choose between which of the attempts will actually be factored into all of the subsequent grade calculations. So we can say either their highest grade, maybe the last graded attempt or an average. So it's really up to you. And for this, I'm gonna say that the highest grade will then factor into all of the subsequent grade calculations and then into the final grade. The next option here, force completion, I'm actually gonna skip right over. I'm gonna come into the set timer area. When we wanna make sure that students only have a designated amount of time to actually work in the test, we can make use of the set timer option. And we can say maybe students are gonna be allowed 30 minutes to take this test. If we have auto submit on, then that means that exactly at the end of that 30 minute timer, that test will submit. It's important to note though that test timers in Blackboard do not pause. So if the student accidentally launched the test and walked away from the course, logged out of Blackboard, that test timer is gonna run and then we'll submit for them. If we by comparison have auto submit off, then that means that the student will start the test, they'll have a 30 minute timer, and at the end they're gonna be continuing to work in the test and it'll mark their test attempt as having gone over time if you wanted to make sure that they have adequate time to complete all of their questions beyond that timer, and the timer is really just a guideline. If you wanna restrict their access to a particular period of time and amount of time on a, on a timer, auto submit is what you'll wanna use. So that's gonna be the point at which I wanna come back to force completion. And I think Blackboard doesn't do a great job at explaining what force completion is, what it does, and what mostly what it doesn't do. Force completion is something that from our help desk, we don't recommend that people use. And the reason for that is that it requires the students to maintain a steady connection start to finish in order to take the test. And if that connection is broken for whatever reason, that would cause their test to submit. So that would mean if they navigated away from Blackboard, if they went to a different area of their course, that would cause their test to submit. But what can also cause their test to submit if they had a, a Wi-Fi blip, even something so brief that they wouldn't have noticed otherwise, if they lost power, if they had a browser issue, that would also cause their test to submit. What force completion does not do, it does not prevent the student from having Blackboard open in another tab, in another browser, in another device, and navigating there. It does not have any control over that. So for that reason, it's best to avoid force completion, and it's not a setting that we recommend. You can certainly make use of that if you feel that you're comfortable managing the issues that can come about with it. But by and large, what is sufficient to restrict students' access during a test is using test timer and auto submit. So I'm gonna move on down here. You do also have the option to set up a password where you would give the password to only select students for whatever you know the circumstance might be, not required. The next section of this page would be test availability exceptions. Now this would be useful if you have a student in your course who has, for example, a testing accommodation where they're supposed to be given double time or time and a half for every test that's taken. Or perhaps if a student is offered an extension or a different window of time to take this test than everyone else in the course. So I'm gonna show you what that looks like. I'm gonna click add user or group. And let's say that my test student number one is one of those students. So I'm gonna hit submit. I can adjust the test timer here and say that this student should get double time, which means that it's gonna be a 60 minute timer 
only for this student. If perhaps this other student also was offered a time to take this test differently than everyone else, I can switch this to say maybe this student is going to be allowed to take this test tomorrow starting at 8 a.m. and then it'll close for that one student Sunday at 11.59 p.m. If you don't make any changes to this and hit clear, oops, actually I should hit save, it's just going to defer to all of these other settings up here. But again, we can make changes to impact only this one single student. Next, we have the ability to use a due date. Now, if you're familiar with due dates in assignments in Blackboard, this is going to be pretty similar. Submissions are accepted after this date, but are marked as late. So that means if we have a due date, and if we are not making use of this setting beneath it, that means that if a student took this test after the due date, it's just going to be marked with a little late stamp. It would not automatically deduct points, though. If we have this checked, do not allow students to start the test if the due date has passed. So say that the due date is the, 30th, is the 31st, rather, and we're allowing this test to continue displaying. If this were checked, the student would press begin, and they would see a message saying the due date has passed. You cannot take this test. So some people, in order to really make sure that there's no confusion about when the student is taking the test, you can combine these settings with your display until setting so that all of it matches. So I'm going to actually just bump this up to 11.59 p.m. so that it matches my display until date. So then next we're going to come down to these self-assessment options. These are probably things that by and large we wouldn't need to make changes to. If we had this section unchecked, include this test in grade center score calculations, then that means that nothing that happens for this grade would figure into any subsequent grade calculations. So that would mean that even though this is a test, it does not factor into any other grades. So typically, we would want to leave this checked unless there was one a particular concern about a setup that you have in your course that might be treating tests a little bit differently. Now this setting here, hide results for, uh, for this test completely from the instructor in the grade center, not one that we typically recommend, unless you have, again, a very particular setup. You'll notice here, this choice cannot be reversed later without deleting all attempts. So this section here under self-assessment, I would say may not necessarily be useful to make changes to unless you're sure of what you need out of this. And typically we don't see people making changes to this setting. And now here, show test results and feedback to students. This is what I was talking about at the beginning of our call with that incorrect and correct feedback. So we can determine how much information the student would see after they finish the test, depending on what your selections are here. So we can say maybe after submission, so right after they're done taking the test, they'll see score per question. So that would be a question by question breakdown of how many points they got based on their answer provided that it's something that is auto-graded. For things that are not auto-graded that do involve your grading, it would just say needs grading. You could then say maybe after or on specific date, let's say on April 1st, April 1st at noon. In addition to score per question, students would be able to see what would have been the correct answer maybe matched against what they submitted, so the submitted answer, or maybe instead of that, submitted answer compared to all possible answers that they had to choose from. You can also use this feedback checkbox. Again, if you're using that incorrect or correct response feedback to say either congratulations, this is the correct answer, or incorrect, that was not the correct answer, whatever you type into those fields. And then last, show incorrect questions. That would just be a stamp on each one of those questions to say whether it was correct or incorrect. Now, what you can certainly be mindful of is how much information is released to students and when. And if you want to make sure that students from one course don't share answers with another course, you can also be mindful of how much information you share with them. But of course, those decisions are left up to you. And you don't necessarily need to stagger information. If you only want 
immediately after the test. They only see score per question. You can leave that as that. And you can also uncheck that. So again, up to you. So the last section on this page is test presentation. And this would determine if students see the test all on one page, so they press begin and see every single question loaded on the page, or by comparison, one at a time, where they press begin, they see the first question, and then once they press save, save and next, then the entire web page reloads to then show them question number two, and so on and so forth. When we have this option selected, we can prohibit backtracking, which would mean that once the student answers question one, they save their answer, they advance to question number two, they would no longer be able to return to question number one to review or change their answer. An option you can make use of, not required, but only available with answers with questions shown one at a time. And then lastly, we have the option to randomize questions, and that would just be to shuffle the order for each student for any attempt. So with all of that said and done here on this page, I'm gonna press submit. And now we'll see that this test, exam number five, will show on the page at the bottom. And we'll see here, availability, item is hidden from students, and it's gonna show up for them March 30th at 8 a.m. So one last thing I can show you here, as far as grading. So I know this isn't a dedicated session to using the Grade Center in Blackboard. I do wanna quickly show you what it looks like to actually grade some of those manually graded test questions. So in my exam one that I was showing at the beginning of our call, I'm gonna show you that test attempt that we just completed. So we find the test column, we find the grade cell for the student, and then we click attempt grade 32620, and then the test will load. And we're gonna be able to see how this one student answered all of the questions and then we'll be able to see, give an answer, this is how the student answered the question. And then the correct answer, that would be what is the model answer, what would be correct. So after reviewing this, we can then say, maybe this was an eight out of 10, and the student should be getting eight points out of a possible 10. And you can also use response feedback if you'd like to type a response for students to see again, making sure that that response feedback checkbox is used when we're looking at the test options page that we were just looking at. So after we look at all of the other questions, again, the rest of them, oh, actually, except for this one, which the student didn't, oh, actually did answer, but let's say that that's not a good answer. No points given. Save and exit. Now you're going to see that this student got a grade of 20 points on this test. 20 points out of, let's just check, out of a possible 75, so not too well. But in any case, that's just a quick rundown of how you can see students' responses and grade the questions that still will be manually graded. So I think that really covers what I was gonna go through with testing in Blackboard. Um, one last thing though, is that surveys in Blackboard are fairly similar to tests. And I'll show you what they look like the only difference here is that even though we have all of these questions, the responses on the survey are by default anonymized. So the only thing that you'll be able to see is if a student has answered the survey and completed it or not. You would be able to see the aggregate results of the survey, but you would not be able to disaggregate the results of the survey and they're not graded. But is another useful option that you can make use of in your course if need be. So, and I think we have about six minutes left. Let me open up our chat. And if you'll give me just one moment, let me open up our participants window. So at this point, I'd invite you to chime in over audio. Again, since we don't have anyone monitoring the chat, I'm gonna do my best to run through a couple of these questions. And if you do have any questions um, that you'd like to chime in with your microphone, please do so. So we don't have a way of changing the default points for all questions that does have to be changed manually, but you can do that all in one go. I'll show you that really quickly. 
Oops, actually, let me go back. So if we go to edit the test, that takes us right back to the test. Oh, actually, this is not a great example. Sorry, let me go back to exam five that no one has interacted with, so we have all of our edit abilities. So if we wanted to say all of these questions should only be worth one point, you can type that one point in and update. You could also say, you know, only these two I'm concerned with right now and say these are worth two points and update. The other option is you can select by question type and say, okay, only the matching questions should be worth three points, et cetera, et cetera. But we don't have a way of changing the default from 10 to something else. So I do see another question about the test timer. You can make the test timer as long as you want. There's no restriction on it. Math through the text editor, the equation editor, that is a way to, um, to use the question, the question type, where is it? Calculated formula. Um, I'd encourage you to take a look at that since I don't know we're gonna have the time to go through that entire um, question format, but there is a good useful guide on help.blackboard.com about it. Um, the recording will be available on the CPD website, and I'll send that out to you um, if you give me just one moment. So SUNY CPD, actually, Remote Teaching Clinic. We have a playlist, and I'm just going to send this to you via chat right now. If you do have any questions that were not able to be answered in this session, please reach out to the Open SUNY Help Desk um, and we'd be happy to work with you on seeing how we can best um, kind of help you cater what you're looking for out of the test to your course. Unfortunately, with the fill in the blank questions, I'm afraid we're not gonna have time to go through all of the options. That would be another one that I would say, having you start with the help.blackboard.com page would probably be the best thing to do first. And then we can certainly help you out with it. But just because there is quite a bit to cover in that, we're not going to be able to go through that um, as thoroughly as I wish. And I don't want to, you know, give you just enough information and then still leave you with um, additional questions beyond that. So I think starting with that help documentation would be best. And again, you're welcome to chime in over microphone if you'd like to ask some questions. So please feel free to do so. A table format can be used to create a question. Um, I'll show you what that looks like. It would just be a matter of using the text box here. So you do have the ability of building a table and this formatting buttons, the series of formatting buttons are gonna be pretty familiar since they are available in several areas of Blackboard. So here's one cell, one cell, another cell, and another cell. Do images have to have a URL added? What you'd want to do to insert an image to your question text is to use this insert edit image button. You'll never want to copy paste it into the text box because that can run into some weird permissions issues where students see a broken image icon. What you'll want to do is to actually use this insert edit image button and then browse computer and then upload the photo. You won't be able to edit the photo once you have it inserted. So you'll wanna make sure that any changes that you want to have as far as like sizes, if you wanted to annotate it for anything, that would have to already be complete. But assuming that's already done, you would then be able to insert. Now I'm not gonna do that just cause this image is enormous, but then you would see it show up in this box. Are we informed when a student has submitted a test? You would be able to see that in the full grade center by seeing if there is a blue in progress icon to tell you that the student is currently working on the test. And then you can also see if it's yellow needs grading, assuming that there are some test questions that do involve manual grading. And if that's the case, you can come to needs grading. Some of this is covered by the uh, uh, collaborate, I'm sorry, not collaborate session, the 
remote teaching clinic session where we talk about grading, where my colleague Lori is assisting with some of these questions and kind of managing Grade Center and how to monitor that. But as far as keeping track of when students have submitted, you would be able to go to the Grade Center to see that. Can a student's test be printed out once he or she takes it? We don't have a printer friendly button in many areas of Blackboard. If there was a need to print out the test, my best recommendation would be to come to this page, open up the test, and then it's usually actually a little bit easier in Chrome. When you do Control-P and you get your print options, you can certainly do it in, uh, in Firefox as well, but I find it's a little bit easier in Chrome. You would choose Adobe PDF as your printer destination, and then you press print, and then it's gonna save this entire web page as a PDF. So it's a little clunky, Oh, and it's giving me some weird permissions thing. Yes, I want to quit. I don't want this to actually save, um, but it is something that can be uh, leveraged for printing options in Blackboard. So unfortunately, I think we're at time. Actually, well, we're a little bit over, but I thank everyone for joining here today. Um, we had some pretty good turnout and a lot of good questions. I know I wasn't able to get to all of our questions that were in the chat. So if you do have questions that, you're, that we didn't get to answer, please feel free to, to reach out to the Open SUNY Help Desk. We are dealing with high volume, but we are certainly happy to help as best we can. Um, this recording, again, will be made available on the SUNY CPD Remote Teaching Clinic website. And you're more than welcome to reach out to us and to the CPD for some assistance since I know this is a difficult time for everyone. We want to make sure that this transition to being online does go as smoothly as it can for everyone. So again, thank you all for joining today. We're here. We're happy to help. So take care, everyone. Stay safe out there.